we took turns being homesick. The person that I remember so well on that journey was our friend and guide, Father Lacombe. He made it possible for us to celebrate the Eucharist at every stop. Through his stories about his beloved Indians, whom he called his children of the forest, my views about them began to change. I had never really seen any of the red men. And I remember our steamship going down the river at Sault Ste. Marie and seeing all of the poor little huts along the riverside. And all the Indians were there and they were fishing. I thought they were heathen. And Father Lacombe said to me, Sister Electa, these Indians in their simple life are more in touch with what is important in life than many of those who accumulate riches and call themselves civilized and then become attached to their riches. He was right, and I was sorry. Thanks to his wonderful stories and how he talked about the Indians, I never closed my mind or my heart to any of God's children ever again. We had fun and trials on our journey. When the winds would pick up on Lake Huron, the water would become so turbulent. I remember there was one day when the, the water was so rough that we had to stay all day in our cabin for fear that moving around would have us throwing up all over each other. <laughs> and we were sitting there in our cabin, wallowing in our own misery, looking sickly and awful and pathetic. And I was praying to the Lord above to either save us or let us die, when all of a sudden I can hear my dear sister, Jean de Dieu, laughing at me. And I look up and she is laughing so hard and with her green face in her little habit. I couldn't help but start laughing as well. And soon we were all, four of us, hysterically laughing at how miserable and sad we all looked. <laughs> when we finally got ourselves under control, Father Lacombe came pounding on our cabin door pleading with us to let him come in and sit down because he said if he felt any more seasick, he was going to cast himself overboard. <laughs> he must have thought we were completely mad when he heard us howl with laughter again. <laughs> we promised that we would throw ourselves overboard with him if he could guarantee us the ability to walk on water. <sighs> we had so many wonderful times on the journey as well. I remember coming into Duluth Harbor and it was like entering a grand amphitheater with all the houses going up on either side of the hills. It was so beautiful. We had been doing Bible study and the scenery was so lovely that we left our book about God to encounter God. Sometimes the water being so turbulent would also be so gentle and it was like being rocked gently to sleep in a cradle at night. Over the time that we made our journey, it, it gave us time to move from Montreal, both in body and in mind. The West was, it really was wild. It was unlike anything I had imagined or expected. When we were riding from our ship uh, in a wooden carriage down the streets of Duluth, we remarked on how different it was from riding in a wonderful carriage on the streets of Montreal and how we must have looked. <laughs> when we finally arrived in, in Manitoba and we had our first mass in St. Boniface Cathedral, I was so pleased and I remember thinking that the mass there was just as uplifting in that new cathedral with no pews as any mass that I had been to in the grand cathedrals of Montreal. And words cannot express how grateful we were to the Grey Nuns. They were so kind and so caring, and we will never forget their kindnesses to us. The opening of our own school, St. Mary's Academy, was so exciting. I was so pleased it was my first teaching assignment. And despite our very real poverty, we were able to bring Mother Maria Rose's love of the arts into our classrooms. I taught creative writing and drama which I loved. But despite my enthusiasm for those early years, St. Mary's Academy was to be my only teaching assignment. 
In the winter of 1874, I caught pneumonia after walking too long and too far across the prairies in the winter with my chère sœur, marie Eri coming home from Mass. My dear sisters were wonderful nurses, but my lungs were too badly damaged. So that summer, I was put on the train that had just begun to run between St. Boniface and Montreal, and I was sent home. But I wrote to my sisters here in Montreal and prayed fervently that I would soon be able to return to them and my beloved students. Who would have thought it? Who would have thought that I would have been one of the founding sisters in Manitoba? Oh, I remember that day so well when we left Montreal. The sisters we had were leaving had packed us a beautiful picnic lunch, and I knew that they would be with us in spirit as we went on our journey. But I was still, oh, sad and afraid. I remember as the train pulled out of the station and we sat down to the meal that they had prepared for us, I cried and cried and cried. <laughs> to be leaving my community and my family, especially my brother, was so difficult. And how would I do in the classroom? I was only 19 years old. I was barely older than the students I'd be teaching. But Sister Jean de Dieu told me everything would be okay. And I remembered Jesus' words, come and follow me. And somehow I knew that Sister Jean de Dieu was right. Everything would be okay, and I needed to follow the call. We arrived in Manitoba, and it became quite obvious why it was so important that we be there. The population of Winnipeg had grown from 100 to 5,000 in only four years. They needed teachers. And so we were there. <clears throat> when I think back to my time in Manitoba, what I remember the most are the people. First, there were my wonderful sisters. I don't think I could have done it without them. So many joys and so many sorrows. So much laughter and so many tears. Bishop Tache, oh, what a wonderful spiritual support he was to us especially when times were tough and we thought we couldn't keep going. And then there were our students and their families. We kept getting more and more students, more people to get to know, more people to teach. And they grew so much. They learned so much and they grew in the faith. Families were so pleased that the education was available. Huh, one father, Mr. Shannon, he even gave us his own horse. He was so happy about <laughs> having his children in school. There were the people, but there were also such wonderful events. We celebrated Bishop Taché's Silver Jubilee while we were in Manitoba. And our students, there they were, stars of the show, entertaining people in both French and English. We, we received many important people. Their Excellencies, the Marquis de Lansdowne, the Marquis de Lorme, just some of the people who came to visit us in Manitoba. And then, on a personal note, I made my final vows in Manitoba. Lots of people go back to Montreal to make them, but not me. <laughs> I got to make them in my new home. <clears throat> me and Sœur marie -Elie. What a wonderful, wonderful day that was. I will never, ever forget it. Well, as I said, there were more and more students coming to our school, and so we needed a new school. Holy Angels opened, which was later to be called the St. Mary's Cathedral School, and I was named director. I thought teaching was scary. <laughs> Fortunately, I was able to stay at St. Mary's Academy, and so I had the support of my sisters as I entered into this new venture. Back and forth, we would walk between St. Mary's Academy and St. Mary's Cathedral School. No sooner had I started as director there than we celebrated Bishop Taché's 40th year in the West. Oh, what a wonderful day. We went on a great picnic with the students from St. Mary's Academy and Immaculate Conception. 
picnics from beginning to the end of my time in Manitoba. In 1888, not long after the opening of Holy Angel, only three years, I was called away from my beloved Manitoba. I was so sad to leave. I had come to know so many people. I had grown so much and seen such wonderful things. But again, Jesus called, come follow me. And I had to go. And again, it was scary. And again, I was sad. But I knew, just like it had been OK in Manitoba, it would be OK wherever God was calling me to go next. I'd always felt close to God from my early childhood. And it seemed to me that the best way for me to deepen this relationship with God and to spend my life helping others was to become a religious. I wanted to join the Sisters of the Holy Name, but they were a teaching order. Now, I had never liked school very much, and I certainly did not have a desire to teach. So for a while, I didn't know what to do. And then <coughs> the way opened up for me. In those days, there were women who joined religious communities and who made homemaking their ministry. They were called auxiliary sisters because their presence provided support to the teachers who had more work than they could handle. I knew that God was calling me to this, and I entered the novitiate as an auxiliary sister. Now, being the only auxiliary sister at St. Mary's Academy proved to be quite isolating. The other sisters spent their days in the classroom, and I was alone in the convent doing my work. And then in the evenings, the boarders claimed a lot of my time. But I'm an introvert by nature, and I grew to love this solitude. There was always so much work to be done during the day that I didn't always have the time to spend in chapel that I would have liked. And so I got a special permission. I would make a holy hour in the middle of the night. These became my rendezvous with God. Sir Jean de Dieu told me one day that during my nocturnal visits, perhaps like my Marie-Rose, that I could just rest in God's presence like a little flower unfolding. To become that little flower became my deepest desire. Now, I wasn't as alone as you might think. From the very beginning, I spent a lot of time with the boarders. When they were sick, I'm usually the one who brought them soup. I'll never forget that December of the second year that we were in Manitoba. There was a diphtheria epidemic. And our youngest boarder, Marie Adeline Beaupré, came down with it. Poor little dear, she was so ill, she couldn't be moved. And so her parents had to come and sit by her bedside. She was only seven years old and got special permission to make her first communion. After having done so, the pain seemed to lessen for a while. But then Jesus came to bring her home with him. We all gathered in St. Boniface for her funeral. That was very hard. All we could do was to be there for her parents and for each other. Through the years, I found that it was the little things that I did that particularly pleased the boarders. How they delighted to smell cookies baking 
and I'm sure that more than half my cookies never made it to the refectory. <laughs> and then sometimes I've organized taffy pulls, how they enjoyed those. But the best times were the ones that I would spend with a boarder who had wakened from a nightmare, or another one who was crying because she was so homesick, or another one who just wanted somebody to listen to her prayer. There was one girl who used to hover about the kitchen a lot, asking me all kinds of questions about God and about why I had become a sister who baked cookies and scrubbed floors. In time, she decided that God was calling her to join us, and she entered the novitiate as an auxiliary sister just like me. When she came back to Manitoba as Sister Mary Richard, I was at the door with a big, warm welcome and a blue apron. <laughs> it was so nice to be getting some help as the work was multiplying each year. It seems that during my 21 years in Manitoba, I was the stationary one, while everyone else came and went. I was there in 1894 to welcome Mother Jean de Dieu back as Manitoba's first provincial. And then there was Father Lacombe, dear Father Lacombe. He would often stop by the convent on his way to and from the Northern Missions. And then it was my turn to become ill. My chronic bronchitis turned into pneumonia. And then it was my turn to board that train that would bring me to Montreal and to our infirmary. Changes, surprises, and God made them all. When I was 27 years old, my life changed suddenly. The general council named three younger sisters and myself to go to this far away mission in the Canadian Northwest. They were a great group. Sister Florentine, the youngest, was so energetic, and her enthusiasm and zeal were so contagious. And Sister Mary Ellie had a heart of gold, and she could always think outside the box. And if we had a problem, Sister Mary Ellie was right there. And Sister Electa, what a flair she had with the pen. She could capture that present moment and make it live for generations to come. Me? I'm not so sure what I brought. But I do know that I hoped and prayed that every person I met would recognize their own goodness, their own giftedness, and that we as sisters with the holy names of Jesus and Mary would be faithful to the constitutions and witnesses of God's compassionate love for all people. My years at St. Mary's Academy were quite the adventure. We started out with nothing, but we did have each other. And those children, they were so eager to learn. We began with 19 students in grades 1 to 10. Most of them were Métis or Aboriginal. And we taught all those regular subjects, but we were faithful to Mother Mary Rose's vision and emphasized the arts and offered philosophy, needlework, music, both vocal and instrumental, drawing, creative writing, drama, mythology. 
We drew the line, though, when it came to physical education and elocution, and we brought in two specialists. In the, by the end of that first year, I remember, we had 125 students. The superintendent's report said, the success of St. Mary's Academy has been remarkable. The number of students increases daily. Public examinations have been held with great success. In 81, the railway reached Winnipeg, bringing thousands of immigrant families. Our classes were bursting at the seams. Thank goodness. Bishop Taché was there to help us, and he purchased some property, and we expanded, beginning again, building anew. Those were the patterns of our lives. In the following years, some new sisters joined us. Oh, I was so delighted, because that meant I could send two sisters to the Immaculate Conception Parish, where there were so many poor children and five out to St. Pierre to start a mission there. It was hard to see the people go, especially Florentine, because we had become such good friends. Mother Mary Rose's dream was being realized, but not without cost. Two of the young sisters, Sister Sylvie and Sister Misael, died suddenly. And then Sister Electa got so sick and she was so in so much pain that we had to send her back to Montreal and she soon died. We grieved their deaths for a very long time. And there were some children too, our dear beloved students, and of course their families. They also died and we mourned their deaths. In 86, Due to increased rheumatic ailments and just sheer exhaustion, I gave, I gave up. Well, I didn't really give up, I guess. My, my health failed and I went back to Montreal. But eight years later, I was named again, not again, but I was named to Manitoba as the first provincial. I was so happy to see Sister Mary Ailey again and the sisters, oh, I was so proud of them. Nothing daunted them, nothing. In 1890, with the Education Act, when all their funding was canceled, did they give up? Never. They dug in their heels and they didn't look back. The result was the schools not only survived, they flourished and we opened new missions at St. Jean and St. Boniface. Only one year later, I had to go to the general chapter and I was elected assistant general. <laughs> Changes, surprises, and God made them all. And what became of our foundresses after they left Manitoba? Sister Electa died at age 29. Despite her strong will to live, her health deteriorated rapidly. It was a difficult struggle, but the grace of a retreat brought her peace shortly before she died. Her companions remember the words of her last letter. She wrote, I am no longer afraid of death. I know that Jesus is coming for me. Despite my frailty, I am confident because I know my Savior will be my judge. Sister Florentine was missioned to Key West, then two years later was named Mistress of Novices. Her time, though, with the novices was brief. One day, on her way back from a picnic with them, she collapsed. She died in less than 35 minutes at age 46 in June 1906. Her novices remembered her words to them at the 
picnic that very day. Live for God alone, so as not to arrive at your final hour unprepared for heaven. Sister Maria Lee's health stabilized, but failing eyesight kept her at Hochelaga for many years. She served as best she could, and at last had the time she wanted for prayer. Weakened by tuberculosis, she asked to receive the last sacraments, rallied for a time, then died during the night at age 73. The infirmarian who discovered her said, God came for her like a thief in the night. Sister Maria Lee would beg to differ. God did not come to me like a thief in the night because my door was always open for him. Sister Jean de Dieu returned to Manitoba in 1899 to celebrate St. Mary's Academy Silver Jubilee. After completing her term as Assistant General in 1905, she served as provincial in Oregon and in Montreal and was superior in Florida. She had been diagnosed with cancer and in 1913, she retired to Longueuil and died at 70 years of age, four years later. She was the only golden jubilarian among the foundresses. Her message was constant. We are pioneers in education and pioneering means hardship and deprivation. Even so, it's all 